justice, again, in the Bible and in Amos, is about distributive justice, the fair distribution of God's earth, and not primarily about punitive or retributive or criminal justice. Now, I can't imagine a society that could exist without criminal justice, but my point is not to say that doesn't matter at all, but that's not what Amos and the prophets and the Bible in general are talking about when they talk about God's passion for justice. It's not about God's passion that evildoers get what's coming to them. I mean, what would be new about that? Um, so, one last comment about why Amos. Amos can introduce people to the power and passion of prophetic language. So I begin with a crucial prologue. It's actually part one on your handout. The social world of the Bible. Now, I've written about this in more than one place, and so you may have run into my exposition of this before, but I'm going to take only five or six minutes to do this, so hopefully it won't be onerous, even if you know it. And by social world, I mean the humanly constructed world of economic systems and political systems. We all live within a social world, our social world, to say the obvious, is the world of early 21st century American society, which in turn is a subcategory of modern Western culture and so forth. And what I'm going to talk about now is the social world of the Bible. This is so important that if you can help people to see this, it will almost certainly change their understanding of what the Bible is about. And if people don't see this, they will miss half or more of the meaning of the Bible. So the social world of the Bible, a semi-technical shorthand phrase, it's the world of ancient or pre-modern domination systems. Now, this is not the social world that the Bible advocates, but the social world it protests against. Four primary features. And once you hear these, you'll realize, well, of course that's the way it was. And of course that's the way it was until the democratic and industrial revolutions of the last few centuries. So this way of putting a society together covers a very broad swath of human history. First feature, <clears throat> pre-modern domination systems were politically oppressive. To say the obvious, they were ruled by elites of power and wealth, the monarchy and aristocracy and their extended families, ordinary people, 90 to 94 5% of the population had no voice in how the society, the system, was put together. And when you think of pre-democratic Europe, of course that's the way it was. This form of social world lasted a very long time. Secondly, pre-modern domination systems were economically exploitative. The top 2% of the population, roughly, the powerful and wealthy and their extended families, once again, typically acquired one half to two thirds of the annual production of wealth in these societies. And most of the production of wealth came from agriculture, of course. These were pre industrial societies. And how did the ruling elites do that? Well, because of the way they put the system together, and in particular in that world, through taxation on agricultural production, but even more so through the ownership of agricultural land 
and employing the peasant class as tenant farmers, sharecroppers, day laborers, and so forth. By the way, the consequences for peasant life were pretty drastic. I won't go through all of them, but I'll use one statistic. <clears throat> life expectancy in the peasant class was roughly half of what it was in the elite class. In the pre-modern world, if you were in the elite class and survived the first five years of childhood, infant and childhood mortality rates were fairly high across classes, but if you survived the first five years of childhood, your life expectancy was 60 to 70 years. This is where the biblical expression of three score and 10 as a good span of life comes from. In the peasant class, if you survived the first five years of childhood and mortality rates in childhood in the peasant class were about 40%, but if you made it to five, your life expectancy was 30. And you can easily imagine the reasons why. Marginal nutrition, inadequate shelter, no sanitation, vulnerability to diseases, and so forth and so forth. Thirdly, these societies were chronically violent. On the one hand, there was the threat and the use of violence by the ruling class to keep their own peasant class in control. And on the other hand, there was the violence of warfare. In the pre-modern world, wars were almost always, maybe always, started by one group of ruling elites against another group of ruling elites. And the reason you can easily see, if you had maxed out the amount of wealth you could extract from your own peasant class, the only way you could increase your wealth would be by acquiring the agricultural land and the peasant labor of some other ruling class. And fourth and finally, these societies were typically legitimated by religion. The theology of the ruling class proclaimed that the social order was ordained by God. Kings ruled by divine right. They were often called the son of God. It was the way the elites had of saying, we didn't put the world together this way, God did. Oh, I can't resist a little aside. The modern version of that is the invisible hand. If we just get government out of the way, an invisible hand will control things for the great good of everybody. And very few people note that the invisible hand typically has one finger raised. <laughs> <clears throat> to sum this up, this is the world of Egypt at the time of the Exodus. It's the world of the monarchy in Israel in the time of the prophets. It's the world of the foreign empires that ruled the Jewish people from the Babylonian exile onward. And of course, to say the obvious, this is the world of the Roman Empire in the time of Jesus and Paul. So, pre-modern domination systems are the historical cultural context for understanding the Bible in general and Amos in particular. And if you don't see this, then you're likely to see the Bible as being primarily about individual belief and individual morality. And it's about so much more. Last part of my exposition of Amos. Amos and what we, what we might call Israelite exceptionalism. 
<clears throat> Many in ancient Israel believed that they had been chosen by God. Uh, you know, it goes way back in Christian Jewish history, the notion of the chosen people and so forth, and were thus God's special people. How much the peasant class believed that is hard to know, but it was part of elite theology. To them, in the name of God, Amos said, are you not like the Ethiopians to me, O people of Israel? Did I not bring Israel up from the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaftor? and the Arameans from Kerr, that Ethiopians, Philistines, and Arameans were the same as Israel, would have been an extraordinary claim to Amos's hearers. He also indicted Israel's worship in you language. There are religious festivals solemn gatherings, sacrifices, hymns, and music. In this text, as often in the prophets, the I is God, that is, Amos speaking in the name of God, and this is probably one of the best-known texts from the prophet Amos. So the first-person pronoun, Amos in the name of God. I hate... I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs, your hymns. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, your organs, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Two comments on that passage. The issue was not that they were worshiping other gods, but what we might call their orthodox worship of the God of Israel the sacrifices prescribed by the Torah, the hymns perhaps from the book of Psalms and so forth. And note the final verse, what God wants instead of lavish orthodox worship is justice rolling down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. This verse is a classic example of prophetic speech known as synonymous parallelism. It's a feature of Hebrew poetry, where the second half of the sentence says the same thing as the first half, hence synonymous parallelism, but in different language. What God wants is not justice plus righteousness, as if they were two different things. Rather, they are the same. I turn now to threats and judgments. Amos not only indicted the elites of power and wealth, but also threatened them with God's judgment. Importantly, when you read Amos or any of the prophets, the threat was not hell, not judgment and punishment beyond death. Rather, <clears throat> the threat was within history. Destruction of their social order, loss of their privileged status, and exile. 